welcome back to the show. Today, we're going to be looking at how you can send better, giving cold fusion email a rest, and there is a pun intended there, with Matthew Clemente. And we're going to look at uh, why isn't email dead already, and, but it really isn't, and how you can use email as an interface for your application. And we'll look at some CF mail settings you may not have been using, but then we're going to look at some transactional mail services that are really exciting that can give you high performance and better deliverability than you may be used to. And speaking of deliverability, you may want to check out your own email deliverability, however you're sending email. And uh, we'll have some tips on that. So welcome, Matthew. Thank you. Happy to be here. And do you want to go by Matthew or Matt? I, I, I noticed your uh, blog has Matt in it, but like you've put Matthew in the... The, the blog has Matt because someone else got Matthew. Uh, oh. So, oh. <laughs> they got there so before. So you are a Matthew. Did. I'm a Matthew. Are you? I'll go by okay. Matthew. Thank you. Just, just wanted to check that. So here's the big question. You know, I, I'm, I'm sure I've read the email died at least 10 times in the last 10 years. You know? Absolutely, yeah. Um, I like to say <laughs> that the... Uh, the only thing people have been declaring dead longer than uh, cold fusion is, uh, is email. Um, <laughs> I found headlines going back to 2002 saying that, you know, email is dead, but we, I mean, we know we're developers. We know that, uh, that it's not. And I mean, the statistics show that it's not. Uh, why, why would people say it was dead? Um, you know, people say that Slack is going to take its place and people said MySpace and Facebook were going to take its place um, and, and all mm -hmm. sorts of things. But um, everything finds its own niche and uh, email being open, being accessible to everyone um, has, has survived and, and thrived. So it's, uh, it's going strong and definitely, yeah. definitely not dead. Yeah, I, th I think you have some statistics on that that show the email volume as, as being growing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, year over year, um, different companies have done, have done studies of the um, numbers of emails shown. And every year they project a certain number. And every year, uh, going back from 2013 to now, it's exceeded every projection. Uh, growth, growth just keeps going up in terms of volume. So. And how many of that is ads for Viagra? <laughs> I, th I think this is real emails, um, but uh, oh, I real email I volume. Okay, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't check the study. Didn't look at the have, spam have to volume. Make sure. which, yes. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure is also through the roof. Yeah. But it, you know why people spam? Because email works. Email gets to people. Yeah. Um, it gets there. So. I mean, they, it'll get delivered. You know, I mean, they built the internet and, and email so it could reroute itself, even if like the servers in between, you know, aren't aren't uh, running or whatever or if they've been zapped by a nuclear bomb i think was the original <laughs> scenario yeah so it's it's out there and it's running absolutely so what about using email in your cold fusion applications because you know i'm sure most people have used the cf mail tag but maybe they just don't realize all the things they could be doing with it yeah see i mean cf mail makes it incredibly easy to send email and uh i think everyone's familiar with setting their mail settings you know, you can set it in CF Administrator. Uh, you can you can do your settings in your CF Mail tag. One of the things that a lot of people don't know is you can actually set your uh, SMTP server settings uh, in your application CFC. Uh, a lot like you set your data source, you can define you know your SMTP server username and password so that you can have a different uh, server per application and not have to hard code it in mm. every one of your CF mail tags. Um, so that, that gives you flexibility as well to define um, a different mail server for different environments. Uh, on your development server, you might want one setting and on your live server, a different one. Um, there's a lot you can do there if you're defining your, your mail settings there in your application.cfc, which mm. I, I don't know how many people know that you can do that but it's, it's a nice option. That is a good thing. I mean, I guess the other workaround is you just stick those settings into variables that, that get passed around everywhere. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, uh, there was a question on an old Ray Camden blog post about how to handle uh, different settings on production or a test server. Um, and I think his answer, this, it, was, it was from years back, but his answer was using a service or something where, uh, you know, if it's production, send the email. If it's dev, write to a log file. 
And, mm -hmm. uh, and that's great. One of the things you can do now, actually, there's, there's a service called MailTrap, MailTrap.io, and they have a free tier, but they're a, a mock or a fake SMTP server. Um, oh. And if you, if you use their settings in your, for your mail server, all the messages that you send, uh, you can see them there. They give you a digest, they give you uh, the oh. HTML content, the text wow. content, uh, all the headers, everything is there for you to look at and it doesn't mm -hmm. get delivered to your client. So mm -hmm. a really nice hack in that regard is that uh, in your app CFC, you know, if it's production, mm -hmm. do your live settings. If it's mm -hmm. dev, set the mail trap settings and you don't have to worry about your emails, you know, going and being delivered to your clients. And you can go in there and you can actually see them. You can see, you know, I sent this email to this client and this is the content exactly as it'd be rendered on production, except mm -hmm. instead of me seeing it, it would be in, you know, my very important client's inbox. And that has the, I mean, I, I guess the other thing we used to do is just have a, a fake email address or a, a dummy account that we'd send the, the development emails to. But this has the advantage that you can send them to the real address and make sure you've got that right and all any CCs and what have you. Yeah, you um, can see it exactly as you sent it. You can see all the headers exactly as they'd be sent. It even, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know how effective they are for everyone. It has a little spam checker in there that looks at the content of your email and, <laughs> and a bunch of features yeah. like that as well. But uh, and that's it's, important it's a nice though, option. That's important for deliverability and we'll talk more about that later in the episode. Um, but what, what about using, you know, what, what are we using these in emails for? Because I, I think people are, are actually missing a lot of uh, things they could be doing with email. Um, like, Yeah, one of the, um, the thing that I like to focus on is transactional emails. I mean, we all know marketing emails um, and no one, no one likes marketing emails. Um, you know, you look for the unsubscribe button as, as soon as you can and you slam you know go through all the doors to try to get off off of marketing email lists but um i like talking about transactional emails you know the emails that um we send from our apps to create accounts to verify emails um there's a whole host of things resetting passwords uh receipts for purchases updates you know comment notifications uh reports, digests, they're really the, the bread and butter of your application. Uh, they're very important. And uh, I think often, often they're neglected. We don't, we don't think of email as being an interface to our application, but in, in the same way that the HTML and the CSS and the JavaScript are an interface that people use, um, email is, is an interface for our application. And, uh, Given the importance of, of these transactional emails, it's, it's an interface that uh, I think we would do well to, to focus on a little more. Uh, it's always ripe for improvement. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. And, and I've actually seen them being used as an interface. You know, sometimes you, they have links in them, like there's a little, like, are you happy with your purchase? Yes, no, something. Oh, else. absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. some companies really do focus on this. Um, and there's a nice, there's a nice touch when they send something like that. And there's an action that you can take in there. Uh, Gmail has an, the ability now with some meta tags where people can uh, trigger an action directly from their Gmail inbox. Um, my favorite example of email as an interface is uh, if you if you've sli signed up for a Slack team, they send you a magic link uh, that logs you automatically into the application. And I don't know when I did it the first time, it felt magical. It was <laughs> delightful, um, and I thought it was just an excellent use of email. It doesn't need to draw attention to itself. It's just making the application experience that much better. And uh, yeah, so there's there's companies out there that do a really good job of using email as, as an interface and focusing on that as well as mm -hmm. the rest of their applications. Mm -hmm. So the key point with transactional email is it ties to something the user's doing. It's not sent on a rote basis like a, a newsletter. It's they've interacted with your application and now they're getting some, some email based yeah. on the interaction. It's, it's, it's based on an interaction. It's directed at an individual um, and because of that, uh, transactional emails, true transactional emails, have a much lower uh, spam rate and, and higher deliverability. Um, mm -hmm. And that's the, the, there's some transactional providers that 
will only send transactional emails. Some send marketing emails as well. But if you really mm. focus on your transactional emails and separate that from marketing, you can build up a stronger uh, reputation for your domain and, and for your mm. email and improve your deliverability. And it's not just deliverability. You, you, I, I think on those transactional emails, often you want them to arrive faster. You know, sometimes when you're mass sending emails, they can take hours to deliver. Oh, absolutely. Transactional yeah. Transactional email, you know, if it's a password reset, people get frustrated if it takes oh, I, a minute or I, two I was, to turn up. I was, I was working on my presentation and I was <laughs> signing up for some, some icon service. And I eventually just didn't, I never got the uh, verification for my account. Uh, I think it mm. came an hour later. And by then I had moved on to, to another provider. So certainly uh, the speed of that is, is absolutely important. You want to get those emails out right away. Yeah, and you and you want them to be deliverable so they don't go in your spam folder. Um, yeah, so it's it's always frustrating. Did you check your yeah. spam folder? <laughs> Shouldn't have to say that. So, is there anything more about um, you know your dev server and how you should set up your email there? Um, no, I, I think I think knowing that you can use your application.cfc is is good. Um, Mm -hmm. Most people by now probably have other other things set up, uh, you know, using a service or something to to handle it differently. Um, mm -hmm. But I like I like letting people know that that option is out there. Um, and when you're sending with CF Mail, one other thing that I, uh, I like to point out is that you can, assuming that your your current uh, SMTP provider supports it, you can set TLS or SSL to true. Um, mm -hmm. And much uh, the way that we're moving to HTTPS for everything online for privacy and security, uh, you obviously want that with your email as well. So setting uh, TLS to true uh, for your emails is a great mm -hmm. step to do that. And obviously CF mail makes it very easy to do that. So I recommend that for people. Uh, and, when they're sending and that prevents people from hacking into the your account it, it just it's it's like https um it encrypts the transactions in between mm. so that you know the content of your of your emails can't be snooped um so mm. that you know it's it's encrypted from where you're going to your smtp server and hopefully from there it's encrypted to the uh, mailbox it's being sent to as well mm. Yeah, I'm just wondering about that latter stage because uh, just thinking how email works and the emails get passed around between multiple servers, I, I don't know if it would stay encrypted in that whole journey. Yeah, it, it, it depends. It depends on the uh, SMTP providers you're, you're working with. Uh, some have an option to attempt to send via TLS to the inbox. Um, mm. Some have the option to, f to fail it there. I mean, sometimes you, mm. don't, you don't have any option at all. Yeah. But when you look into that, uh, there's a handful of approaches that different providers will take in terms of mm -hmm. trying to keep messages encrypted uh, or not. You know, you, you do as much as you can. Right. And then what, what about plain text versus HTML email? Uh, I'm, I'm of the mind that, that you want to send both because not everyone, uh, not everyone accepts HTML emails and uh, mm -hmm certain spam checks will look to see if you've sent both. Um, and even if they're similar um, in jumping to the deliverability topic, if you don't mind, there's a, there's yeah, a wonderful sure. service out there. Um, I'm going to be mentioning lots of services. Mail tester. Mail tester. Yeah. Mail tester.com uh, will give you an email address that you can send to. Um, and they run the email through a barrage of various um, various spam tests, and then they'll rate it on a scale from from one to ten, and tell you how deliverable it is and what you can do to improve it. Um, and it's, I think, at the free tier, you get only a certain number of checks a day, and then you can you know you can purchase you can purchase more, but uh, they'll check it with spam assassin and they'll check it against mm. blacklists. Um, mm. And so one of the things that they check uh, to improve your message is whether it has both HTML and text content, uh, mm. which, you know, you can do once again with CF mail uh, fairly trivially, but I, I'm, I'm a big promoter of, of sending both just yeah. so that you're providing it there for, for how people want to receive it. Right, because it's often a lot easier to read an HTML email if you have that turned on. Um, but if people don't have it turned on, 
then it's going to look like a mess. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, the other thing that I've used, uh, you probably use something like it, is uh, senderscore.org. It kind of uh -huh. checks yep. all your. Yep. But yeah. Maybe we'll talk about deliverability uh, more in a bit, a bit later. Sounds so, good. Yeah. So basically, you're saying that you, you want your emails to be really deliverable and fast. And that may mean you don't want to use the corporate email server because that maybe has some deliverability issues or, or isn't super fast. Or, uh, Absolutely. Is that so th you, then you're looking at a transactional email service that, that specializes in sending these really fast and making sure they get to the inbox. Yeah. So, so of, of, well, I've experienced them of late. There, there's a host of, uh, transactional email services out there um, that specialize in sending these emails. They're all relatively cheap and there's a lot of functionality that comes with them. Um, I just remember the first time I used one of these and I was just blown away by how simple it was to get lots more data. And um, they're all companies that are obsessive about email um, and really focus on the nitty gritty of email so that you don't have to, because uh, mm -hmm. I, I know email, you know, you talk about email and people's eyes glaze over, <laughs> um, but they're there worrying about reputation and how many emails are yeah. bouncing and what IPs are yeah. good and bad and improving reputation. So yeah. if you use these services, you can leave the nitty gritty uh, right. stuff of, of email to the people who really are obsessed with it and focus on you know improving your your application and benefiting from from their knowledge and what they do. Well, and, and they're going to look after it twenty four seven. Whereas if you use your own email server, you know if something goes wrong, you might not find out for days. You know. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's it's nice to have you know you can have with with all of the ones that that I've ended up, ended up talking about. Uh, they have status pages where you can you know make sure that everything is up and running smoothly. There's alerts if there's ever a delay in, in emails being delivered. Um, yeah, it's nice to know that you've got someone watching over uh, that very important part of your application. Mm. So what, what's your favorite transactional email service right now? Um, so, well, the question that I usually get is which is best, um, which I think is, is kind Ooh. of a, a false That's loaded question. <laughs> it's I think, well, if, if you do, if you do searches online comparing them, uh, there's, yeah. there's, you know, advertise, they all advertise that, that they're the best, you know, you know, one, you know, we're better than the rest. But, yeah. um, I, I think that the best and my favorite would always depend on the use case. Um, mm, they all sense. kind of, I, I haven't looked at every transactional provider because there really are a lot of players in this space, but yeah. the biggest ones and the ones that I've looked into the most, um, are, uh, AWS with their SES service, um, SendGrid, Postmark, SparkPost, and Mailgun. Um, and honestly, they're all excellent services, but they have different areas where, where one's better than the other and where one has more functionality than the other. Um, so, I mean, I, I can run through uh, the sure. way that I see their use cases kind of shining. Um, if, if you're worried about cost, uh, AWS with SES is by far the cheapest. Um, it's definitely, um, orders of magnitude cheaper than the other because Amazon, Amazon just, you know, has bargain basement prices. I don't generally recommend using SES just because if you're going to be using one of these transactional services, um, you probably want to benefit from, from some of the more advanced features and hands-on support. And you're, you're not going to get that when you're paying those bargain basement prices from Amazon. All of the other providers have a lot more feature, features, a lot more active support. Um, but if cost is the well, most important, you just, you do, you do SES and it's, it's, it's there. Right. And you have to configure it yourself, right? With S it's, SES. it's a lot more hands-on than the others. Yeah. yeah you're, you're definitely plugging in all the wires yourself and making mm -hmm. sure that stuff's not 
across. So it's really just a step above, you know, running your own, your own server. Mm -hmm. um, if you're doing a lot of marketing emails as well as transactional, SendGrid has a whole host of marketing uh, features built into the product and a lot of support. Um, you know, if you're using a, one of the things that, that uh, I've recommended to companies is if they're using something like uh, GetResponse or MailChimp um, or uh, Campaign Monitor, whatever, the whole score of marketing email companies, um, they might be able to combine their marketing and transactional with SendGrid because SendGrid has uh, mm. campaigns and templates and a lot of the features that those uh, marketing companies advertise as well as this transactional side. So you can kind of cut out the cost of the marketing and you know handle all of your email under one roof. If you're doing marketing uh, and want to consolidate there, SendGrid is, in my opinion, the way to go. Mm -hmm. The complete flip side is Postmark. Um, they are very strictly only transactional emails. Um, and they, they make you check boxes six times anytime you're setting anything up to say that you'll only send transactional. Um, but they really, in my experience, they have the highest deliverability of, of the transactional providers I've worked with. Yeah, when, you, when you run emails from them through, uh, through mail tester, uh, their scores are generally off the chart. Um, there's a lot of great features and great transactional stuff in there. They tend to cost more. There, there's volume discounts, but they tend to cost more than the others. So the, you know, no marketing emails uh, and they cost more but in terms of transactional deliverability speed and a lot of other features they're excellent, excellent. um with when you say cost more what you know you're talking about several arms and legs here or what well it, it depends uh if you're using postmark it depends they give you a prepay option which is which is cheaper um and it depends how many emails you're sending. Are we talking like a hundred dollars or ten thousand dollars? So, so if if we want to run, if you're sending uh, like fifty thousand emails a month, um, mm -hmm. if you're going to do that on Amazon via SES, it's like five dollars. Mm -hmm. If you're doing it on Postmark and you prepay, it's fifty. So mm -hmm. ten times more. Um, now, as as volume increases. Uh, you know, you, you get emails cheaper, um, but everyone else falls within that range. Uh, Spark post would be the next cheapest if cost at, at that tier, because it varies mm -hmm. by tier, but at, at 50,000 for Spark post, uh, it would be $9, $9 a month. Um, and SendGrid and Mailgun, that would both be $20 a month. Um, so th there's a range, there's a range there and it varies depending on what tier uh, of emails you're sending, you know, if you're, I don't know how big people's people's emails are. If you're sending 500,000 a month, um, the price, uh, post postmark is actually much more affordable if you're sending mm. volume that high. Mm. Um, and some of the other ones go up a bit higher. Mm -hmm. And then you mentioned smart post and mail gun. What's yes. their, what are they good for? I, I see Spark Post and Mailgun as, as very developer friendly. Um, the primary reason for that is that they both have a free tier. So if you're just starting out uh, a product and you want to send these emails for free, you can do that on both of those services. Um, at Mailgun, I think it's up to 10,000 emails a month for free. And at Spark Post, it's up to 15,000 emails a month for free, mm. uh, which is really, it's the other, the other services have um, a free like initial offering, but once you're past that, you can't keep using the service. Uh, with, with SparkPost, you can spend 15,000 emails a month for forever, uh, Mailgun 10,000 emails a month, your first 10,000 are free, um, and then it kind of grows with you. So if you're starting out with a product or you've got, uh, even, I mean, if you want something affordable, and you have something sending fewer than 10,000 emails, then that's a great option. Mm. Uh, in terms of differentiating the two and their developer friendliness, SparkPost does tend towards the marketing side in terms of what they offer, um, email templates and uh, 
different reports that look at uh, engagement um, that are geared towards marketing. Whereas Mailgun has um, a lot more of the nitty gritty developer friendly stuff. Their logging, their logging is better than Spark posts in my opinion. They've got some really robust inbound email handling. You can set up a route that says, you know, if I've an email is sent to this address um, and uh, it's sent from this address, I want to store it on my server, I want to fire a webhook, and then I want the email forwarded to someone else. You, you can do some programming like that, which mm. uh, gives you the ability to automate some stuff in, in interesting ways. So they've got that nitty gritty side of the developer friendly, I think down very well. Mm. And then which mail services shouldn't you be using and why? Um, I, I don't like to, I don't like to bash email services. I, I think that uh, if, if, well, it, it comes down to use, use cases. If, if you're sending marketing emails, you shouldn't be using postmark because they'll probably mm -hmm. kick you off uh, once, right. you know, once you get a bunch of spam, spam reports. Um, but what I was thinking of is things like MailChimp, you know, you shouldn't be using that for transactional email. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. There, there's a host of, of um, actually MailChimp has, and I, I wasn't involved in this because it was a little bit before I was using transactional services. Uh, MailChimp's has a transactional service that goes along with them. It was Mandrill. And at one point, uh, not that long ago, they bundled Mandrill, their transactional service with their marketing emails. And a bunch of people who had a really great deal set up sending only transactional emails suddenly found that they had to pay a bunch more from the base MailChimp price to keep using it. And a lot of developers got really upset with how they handled that. Uh, mm. It didn't impact me, but I know that if, if you're out there looking, uh, you'll see a bunch of angry posts from developers about how MailChimp and, and Mandrill handled their mm. developer community. Mm. Um, but that, that's it. You shouldn't be using a, a mail service that, that doesn't fit your needs. Uh, so you should know what right. your needs are. Yeah. So let's talk deliverability because, uh, you know, I think people often don't pay attention to that and they're sending out these thousands of emails, uh, but they aren't all getting there. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of things you can do to improve your deliverability. Um, Regardless of, of how you're sending, uh, you want to make sure that you've got your SPF records set up right. Um, it's, a, it's a text record, text DNS record uh, that says what servers are allowed to send emails on your behalf. A lot, a lot of people are familiar with SPF. Um, mm -hmm. Along the same lines, there's a DKIM, which um, basically is is an encryption thing that makes sure that your message hasn't been altered in transit um, so it, it's a digital sign based on the contents of an email when an email service provider gets the message you can say okay this email wasn't changed uh, you know someone didn't intercept it because it wasn't sent securely change the content of the email and then and then forward it along um, you definitely want to set up spf and dkim records on your domain uh, with the transactional providers I discussed, um, they make it very easy to. In some cases, they don't require you to, uh, but you should. Um, and anything that's that's checking your deliverability, any of those services, will tell you if you've set these up or not. Mm. Those are the, the basic things that you should set up. Um, uh, I think more important at this point is DMARC. It's a relatively newer um, security uh, setup uh, for email. It's kind of built on top of SPF and DKIM. Mm -hmm. Because those two uh, are not tied to the visible from domain, there's still spoofing that's possible, even if you have your SPF and your DKIM set up. Mm -hmm. If you set up a DMARC record, it gives you the ability to tell email service providers what to do if an email comes in and it doesn't match your SPF record or if it, uh, if it fails the DKIM check. Mm -hmm. You can say to Gmail, uh, if an email comes in and it says that it's from mattclemente.com, but I don't have an SPF record saying that that domain can send, 
either bounce it, put it in spam, or don't do anything, but you know, make, it, make a note of that. And then DMARC also has reporting. So they'll report back, if you set up a DMARC record, uh, you can get reports back on the emails that email service providers see being sent from your domain. The problem with the reports is that they're these nasty XML documents that aren't <laughs> friendly, but uh, again, there's a service out there. Uh, if you go to uh, dmark.postmarkapp.com, they help you set up a DMARC record and they'll send you, they'll parse the reports from the email service providers, consolidate them and give them to you in a friendly format so you can see that your records are set up right, who's sending emails on behalf of you, um, and it really gives you a, a good look at what's going on for mm. your domain. So I'd look into DMARC. Uh, if you don't have a DMARC record set up, you should have one uh, because you can tell people not to send on behalf of your domain, uh, and that gives you a lot of security um, one of the examples that I do in the presentation is that I'll take a domain that people know that doesn't have a DMARC record set up and I'll use a transactional service and I'll send and I'll, I'll basically spoof that it's from the domain. And depending mm -hmm. on what email client you're using, it, it can look like it's from that provider. Whereas mm -hmm. if a DMARC record is set up, I can send it to junk and it never gets to the inbox. Mm -hmm. So DMARC, super important. That's definitely, a, I think, a very important tip if you're looking at deliverability and setting up your emails correctly. Right. Because, you know, these days, most ISPs are running some kind of spam catching software that's mm -hmm. looking for these things uh, along with the content of the email and a few other things they look for. Um, yeah. So they definitely, if you, if you look, you can look at the headers at how the uh, different email service providers handle your emails and they check a lot of them check, obviously for a DMARC record, putting that in place should help with your deliverability as well as uh, giving you a lot more control and visibility into what's going on for the emails that your domain is sending. And they definitely look for the SPS and DKIM. Uh, yep. Records. Yeah. Those, those are, those are ubiquitous. They're, they're, they're right. across the but board. But you'd be amazed how many people miss to configure these things or don't even set them up. Or absolutely set up and they're not you know. absolutely yeah uh, um, another reason that using some of the deliverability testing services can give you a view into what's going on uh and yeah, then you mentioned you mentioned mailtester.com and uh yep. I, I had mail dash score. tester in case people right. aren't yeah yeah we'll put it in the show notes so absolutely there. and senders score sender score is dot org is another one that i've used um i think uh Google has one. I'm forgetting where it is, but I've used it in the past to check deliverability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so definitely worth doing that. And it's great to have a service that just checks like every month or every week or whatever, what's going on. Mm -hmm. when, when you use one of these transactional services, do you have to change your, the domain you're sending from? Do you have to have a separate domain that you, you send or it can come from your domain or? So they, they all, they differ slightly in how they have you set it up. Um, from all of them, you can set it up to send from your root domain. So I can send from mattclemente.com. Uh, some of them have you configure their access by adding records to a subdomain. So for Mailgun, they recommend setting up a subdomain you verify an SPF and a DKIM record, you know, to show that you control it. And then you still send from the root domain, but you're, you're configuring um, them at the subdomain level. For actually for all of them, except for Postmark, they have you set up a subdomain to uh, do the initial config, but you can send from your root domain. Um, I should say too, with the transactional services that I've talked about, their big focus is their REST APIs, which you know there are CFML wrappers for them, but you can send from SMTP uh, using them. They all have SMTP endpoints that you can integrate with your app. 
really easily. It's, it's almost, I mean, if you make sure you do the config right, I wouldn't recommend just dropping it in. But it's about as close to dropping in their SMTP settings as possible. Uh, where you could start using the service very quickly without having to reconfigure your app dramatically in order to use them. So which would you recommend, using the REST API or just going straight in? I'd, I'd recommend uh, if, if you've got your application set up and it's running on SMTP, you should use SMTP. It gives you an easy path to migration you get access to a lot more reporting that you didn't have before, uh, some link tracking, click tracking analytics that you didn't have, and then uh, migrate to the REST API as needed. Um, there's generally more functionality that you can do with the REST API. Um, REST generally is faster than SMTP because uh, it's just a single HTTP call and SMTP tends to be chatty. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but more, the REST API, I've found it's easier to use and you can get access to some more advanced features, but certainly in terms of just getting started with them, SMTP would be the way to go. Mm -hmm. And then you, you mentioned webhooks earlier. T tell us how that would work in, in so, you know, these yeah. services. So one of, the, one of the neat features that these transactional email providers uh, provide is in addition to sending email, they give you more functionality. So you can trigger um, a, a webhook to get called when an email gets opened. You can trigger uh, webhooks to get called when emails bounce, when they get delivered. Um, you can set up inbound email parsing where if an email comes in, you call out to, to a webhook with information about the email. Um, Basically, it makes email much more programmable, so you can mm -hmm. take actions based on what's happening either with your emails or in your emails. Um, they all handle this in slightly different ways, but it's, it's nice to know, you know, for example, if you want to take action on an email bounce, you know, if an email to, a, to someone bounces, maybe you want to temporarily disable their account. Uh, maybe you want to do something else to, because that's obviously a problem if, if one of your users' emails is, is bouncing. Maybe you want to uh, remove them from your marketing emails if a transactional email to them bounced. Mm -hmm. um, if someone's clicked on a link, depending on what it is, you might want to do something else with their account. You know, if it's a verification thing, you'll, you'll know that they verified. Mm -hmm. um, you can do something else. Uh, you can check if an email was open so you know that it was received and, and trigger actions based on that. Um, what's nice too with these type of calls out is that you can uh, easily interact with other services that uh, use APIs. So uh, Zapier is a nice, uh, it's, it's like an if this then that type service that integrates with the APIs. Um, but you can say, uh, for example, we had a situation at, at work where someone wanted clients to be able to fill out a form that sent him PDFs uh, that he stuck into Trello, all this different stuff, which we could have built, but it would have been a lot of work. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. it would have taken some time to build for him, but we were able to set it up so that... Uh, there was a free online form service that then used one of these uh, transactional email services. So it posted the form to the transactional service, which hit Zapier and stuck it into Trello. And I didn't have to program anything because these services all used their APIs to interact with each other. And I could keep working on our main app and he got the functionality that he needed. Mm -hmm. So uh, APIs, open up the ability to interact with other APIs and uh, that gives you functionality that you might not have had before. Mm. So that, that gives you a lot more power um, in how you interact with your users and, and email. Absolutely. Uh, any, yes. Anything yeah. else on cold fusion and transactional email you want to tell us about? Or? Um, I'd just say that uh, it's, there's, CFML wrappers for these REST services. And uh, 
in terms of you know the value of cold fusion it makes it very easy uh to write the wrappers and to interact with these these apis um for for example uh, spark post didn't have a cold fusion wrapper uh, i had worked on the send grid one mm -hmm. so if, if you look at the commits at github i put together a, a basic spark post one to send emails and mm -hmm. you know in in 20 minutes i sent the first email and in an hour it was it was basically done um so cold fusion definitely makes it uh possible to interact with them even if they don't it's not one of the three or four built-in api wrappers they provide um there's cold fusion ones either out there or that can get put together to interact with them uh mm. which is which is great i think nice cool so what's the future of cold fusion and email um i i think in in CF mail, we've got, we've got a great tag for, for sending SMTP emails. Um, I don't think it's necessarily missing anything, but uh, there's other services out there that mean that you don't need to use SMTP, but you can still use cold fusion. I would never say, you know, abandon CF mail. Uh, I wouldn't say abandon SMTP, but uh, cold fusion, it's, nice that it gives us the ability to use these other services to send email it doesn't lock us into to just sending via smtp so i'd say you know cold fusion's future with email is as bright as email's future it's it's looking good all right so let's just change gears a bit and i'll ask you some questions i'm asking everyone i'm interviewing which is why are you proud to use cold fusion um I'm proud to use cold fusion because it, it helps me make uh, exciting products uh, and exciting tools. And it, it makes my life easier. Uh, I've really enjoyed using it to write these uh, API wrappers and work on various API wrappers. Um, cold Fu I'm proud to use it uh, also because of the community. Uh, I've definitely found that the people who are active in the community uh, are willing to help someone out when they don't understand things uh, and are generally willing to spend time from their day uh, to, to help you solve a problem. Um, I've gotten a lot of help on the Slack channel. So uh, I'm proud to use it because I enjoy using it. It's easy to make great things. And uh, there's a community that uh, is willing to help. And that's, uh, I think that's wonderful. That is great. And we'll put the uh, link for the Cold Fusion Slack channel into the show notes for anyone who hasn't discovered that yet. Yeah. If, if you haven't joined it, join it. It's, it's wonderful. Yeah. Um, so we talked a, a bit earlier about how both email and Cold Fusion have been, you know, lambasted for dying, but really they're alive. Mm -hmm. and, and in fact, I, I don't know if you can see this. I've got a little Cold Fusion alive. Oh, there you go. Wonderful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, for those watching on video on our YouTube channel. Um, so what would it take to make Cold Fusion even more alive this year? Um, I think uh, more people interacting with the community uh, that's there. It's, it's certainly a community that's passionate um, and willing to help. And if you're out there and you haven't gotten involved on the Slack channel, or you know, listening. Well, if you're listening to this podcast, you've already you've already done that. But uh, you even, never uh, know. You'd be surprised. Not everyone has heard of that. If I, I, I think listening to this podcast, engaging uh, in the community, the Slack channel is a great forum for that. Uh, you can do it on on Twitter as well. Um, and then even on uh, on GitHub or something, looking at the repositories that are out there. Uh, you know, if if there's a um, a product out there or not a product uh, something uh code on github that uses cold fusion and you're looking to use it if it doesn't work uh, create an issue there and, and try to help improve it or uh, take it yourself if you've improved it then uh you know create a pull request and, and put it back up there or if you want to get involved in the community um i think one of the things one of the things that i've been trying to do on my blog is it, if i run into a problem and I solve the problem, I try to write about it. And it's not just for the community, it's for me, because I know that in six months, I'll forget that I solved the problem and I'll be able to come back to the thing that <laughs> I wrote and it helps me. 
Um, so it's for myself, but it's also there contributing because if you've run into a problem, there's someone else who's run into it. And if you've solved it, maybe you'll solve it for them and that makes their life easier. So to make it more alive, people just need to dive into the community at large, I think, and, and try to you know, pitch in where they're able. Obviously not everyone has all the time in the world, but it's- uh, there's, there's always someone else who's less skilled than you are in some area of cold fusion, so. Absolutely, you know, you absolutely. Help someone out. Yep. Um, and I think it's a great idea to, to blog about problems you've solved using cold fusion. I, I'd also encourage people to blog about successes they've had. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, and you know, I'm just also going to mention Forgebox, which is another repository of cold fusion yep. Um, yep. code you can use and contribute to. And of course, you, you've spoken at, uh, you're, you're speaking at CF Summit, and I think you spoke at NC DevCon. Yep. Did you speak at any other events this year? Or? No, those, I, I, attended, uh, I attended CF Objective um, mm -hmm. and spoke at NC DevCon. I'll be at CF Summit. Those, those are right. my, my, three, my three for the year. That's excellent. So go to Cold Fusion conferences was the other Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And and that brings me to my final question here, which is what are you looking forward to at CF Summit this week? Um, you know, I've been really focused on working on my presentation. Uh, <laughs> so I've I've gone over I've gone over the schedule, but uh, I think again, just that I keep coming back to the same thing, the community. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to talking to people that uh, I've only chatted with on Slack um, and, and interacting with them in, uh, in person uh, and being there with the community uh, alive, actually alive, uh, face to face. Uh, that's, that's the biggest thing that I'm looking forward to. Great. So um, just for folks who don't know, Matthew is one of the founding partners at season four uh, where they solve legal problems problem industry stuff with cold fusion um and uh, he's been doing cold fusion for a long time now it must be at least 10 years i think right yeah it's 10 maybe 11 uh i started when on mx mx7 uh so it's a while and, back and I, yeah that is a while back it's uh, at least 10 years i think um and i and i saw a sneak peek of your slides it looks like you're uh, you have a child who's also into cold fusion <laughs> Yeah, I've got uh, I've got my my one year old wearing a wearing a cold fusion t shirt, you know. So it's certainly not dead. It's got a future. He's one year old. <laughs> so if uh, folks want to find you online, what's the what are the best ways to do that? Uh, you can find me on Twitter. It's uh, at m j c l e m e n t e eighty four at m j clemente eighty four. Uh, I'm on GitHub m j clemente. And I blog when I have the time at blog.matclemente.com. So come over there, give me a comment. Uh, happy to hear anything that uh, anyone has to say. Great. And also the CF Slack channel, of course. Absolutely. I'll be, I'm on that too. I think it's MJ Clemente there, although I'm not positive. Yeah. yeah. And we'll put all those into the show notes so you can find them easy. Well, I really appreciate you staying up late in New Jersey to do this interview, uh, Matthew, and good luck with your talk at CF Summit. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate it. It's been a good talk.